Hi, good evening. Welcome to November. And it uh, seems to me last month we had a little bit warmer weather, but I guess we're into winter time. Um, we have two, I think, funny shows tonight. Well, they're kind of funny. You, hopefully you brought your sense of humor with you. Um, the first one uh, is going to be Dragnet, and I spent a little time at home writing a, uh, an intro. This is the city, Riverside, Illinois, USA. It's a peaceful place in the western suburbs of Chicago where the sun shines every day and the temperature is a constant 75 degrees. <laughs> Not much crime occurs here. Still, once in a while, we hear about crimes, often family-related, that occur in big cities like Chicago and Los Angeles. Tonight, the Riverside Township radio players will tell you of such a crime that took place May 31st, 1955. We called it the Big Sisters Caper. It is one of 314 situations we dealt with over the years. My name is Officer Frank Smith. I work with Detective Sergeant Joe Friday. And now here's our announcer, George Fenneman. Chesterfield brings you Dragnet. Put a smile in your smoking. By Chesterfield. So smooth, so satisfying, Chesterfield. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you're about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to burglary detail. An elderly woman reports that a man has stolen $300 from her apartment. She says she saw him. Your job, check it out. Put a smile in your smoking. Next time you buy cigarettes, stop. Remember this, in the whole wide world, no cigarette satisfies like Chesterfield. Put a smile in your smoking. Instantly, you'll smile your approval of Chesterfield's smoothness. So smooth, so satisfying. You want the mild, we make the mild, mild and mellow with the smooth and refreshing taste of the right combination of the world's best tobaccos. So next time you buy cigarettes. Stop. Stop smoking with the smile. With Chesterfield, smiling all the while. With Chesterfield, put a smile in your smoking. Just give them a try. Let them Chesterfield. They sound. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Thursday, May 19th. It was sunny in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of burglary detail. My partner's Frank Smith. My boss is Captain Bernard. My name's Friday. We were on our way out of the office and it was 3.47 p.m. when we got to a small apartment house on the corner of Olympic and Sixth, the Topeka Arms. Uh, what was that lady's name again, Joe? Dunbetter, Martha Dunbetter. Uh, let's see, oh yeah, here's her mailbox. Number eight. Must be upstairs. Well, how do you figure that? Only eight mail slots means eight apartments. Yeah. Stands to reason number eight will be on the second floor, doesn't it? Oh. Well, I suppose so. Uh, 
I wonder who comes from Kansas. Hmm? Well, didn't you notice the plaque out in front? Topeka Arms? Yeah. Well, that's a city in Kansas, Joe. Topeka, Kansas. Sure. Well, somebody must have come from there. The owner or the builder. Why else would they give the place a name like that? I don't know. Well, it stands to reason, doesn't it? I guess so. You see, you're not the only one who can do it. Do what? Deduce. Oh. Uh, that's what they call it. The way you figure it out, number eight is on the second floor. Deduction. Uh-huh. I was just giving you another example when I proved that somebody connected with the building used to live in Kansas. Yeah. Deduction. Works all the time. Uh, see? Right down there. Number eight, just like you said. Uh-huh. Never fails. Who's there? Police officers, ma'am. Oh, just a second. I'm coming. I'm coming. Oh, my goodness. You certainly got back in. Oh, dear me. You aren't the same ones, are you? No, ma'am. This is Frank Smith. My name's Friday. Uh, there were two other policemen here just a little while ago. It is a shame you didn't know you could have saved yourself a trip. No, that's all right, ma'am. We knew they'd be here. You did? Yes, ma'am. They're patrol car officers. They were in the neighborhood, so they answered your call. Well, I just don't see why you had to bother yourselves, too. It's no bother, ma'am. All right, if we come in. Oh, my. Yes, please do. Just imagine all four of you trying to help me get my money back. Certainly makes a body feel important. Did the other officers say where they were going? I, I'm not sure. I wasn't able to follow everything they said. Uh-huh. Uh, something about a canvas. Yes, I believe it. that was the word. They, they meant they were going to canvas the area for the suspect. Suspect? The man who stole your money. Oh, but I don't just suspect him, officer. I know he did it. I saw him. Yes, ma'am. You're Mrs. Martha Dunbetter, is that right? No, not exactly. Oh? It's, it's Miss Dunbetter. I'm still single. Uh-huh. Would you mind telling us just what happened this afternoon, Miss Dunbetter? Oh, no, I don't mind at all. It's still quite clear. Uh, yes, ma'am. You see, when a person gets to be my age, well, sometimes you aren't able to remember every little detail. Uh-huh. But a thing like this, it, it sort of sticks out. Sure. Go ahead, please. What was that, young man? Go ahead. About this afternoon. Oh, well, um, now let's see. I fixed myself some lunch and then I did up the dishes. It must have been about one o'clock by the time I had finished. Yes, ma'am. Afterwards, I put on my hat and I went down to the library. It, it only a couple of blocks from here, the Grover Cleveland branch. Uh -huh. I took back my books and I checked out two fresh ones. There isn't much of a selection. It's a small branch. I see. Of course, they're very nice to me. I've been going there for quite a spell. Sure. And they'll order things from downtown if you ask them to. But then you have to wait several days, and I wanted some reading material for now. Mm. So I picked out two novels. Actually, they're stories I've read before, but I'll enjoy them just the same, and I won't have to concentrate quite so much. Yes, ma'am. What happened next? I came home, and there he was. Ma'am? That awful man. Oh. Well, uh, just where was he? Here in my apartment. I meant which room? Over there. The bedroom. I see. I guess he didn't hear me let myself in. I always try to move around as quietly as possible. Even in the afternoons, people sometimes like to take a nap. Uh-huh. Not that you can do much napping in this building. Radios blasting, televisions, Victoria Records. Why, that girl downstairs even has a dog. A dog in an apartment house. It isn't fair to the animals, let alone the other tenants. 
Uh, you said this man was in your bedroom? Yes, uh, that's right. Uh, there, where, that's where he was. As soon as I came in, I heard him. At least I heard somebody moving around. At, at first I thought it was Mrs. Parker, the manager. I know she sneaks into my apartment and noses around. Of course, she says she doesn't, but I know better. Uh-huh. Well, I said to myself, I've got her red-handed this time. So I marched into the bedroom, all ready to give her a piece of my mind. Mm -hmm. I was never so flabbergasted in my whole life. He was standing in front of the dresser, going through my pocketbook. I see. My black patent leather. That's the one he was holding. Uh-huh. I didn't say anything, not at first. I was too taken aback, but I guess I must have made a noise. Anyway, he turned around all of a sudden, and when he looked at me, my voice sort of came up into my mouth. What are you doing here? He, I asked him point blank. Just what do you think you're doing? He didn't answer. He only grinned and went the on going through my handbag. I suppose he figured I was a harmless old lady and couldn't stop him. How much money was in the purse? Well, I'm not positive, uh, not to the penny, about $300. In cash? Yes, sir. You, you see, I have been saving dimes for the last 15 years. You, you mean this $300 was in dimes? Oh, goodness gracious, no. What I do is go through my change every night and I put all the dimes in my dime bank. Then when it is full, I take it down to the real bank and change the coins into bills. The dime bank holds about $25. I see. You'd be surprised how much a person can save that way. It mounts up. Uh, yes, ma'am. Do you know the denominations of the bills? I guess there were mostly tens, maybe one or two bigger ones. Why'd you keep that much cash on hand? When you're my age, you never know what's going to happen. A person can get sick, has to go to the hospital. You need cash at a time like that. Uh-huh. Now what did this man do next, Miss Dunbetter? Well, he found the money, my $300, and stuffed it into his pockets. That's where I kept it, in the black patent leather. I see. I, I told him if he didn't put it back, I would call the police. That didn't seem to worry him a bit. Afraid I won't be able to stick around till they get here, Granny. That's what he said to me. Then he strolled out of the apartment as big as life. I was dumbfounded to do anything about it. I understand. I heard him tramp down the stairs, then I heard the front door slam. When I was sure he was out of the building, I managed to get my wits together and I dialed Central. Central? Uh, yes, uh, the operator. She put me in touch with the police station. Had you ever seen this man before, Miss Dunbetter? No, I, I'm sure I never did. Oh, could you tell us what he looked like? I, I told the other police officers. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, we'd like to hear it, too. Well, he was a tall man. How tall? As big as you, I'd say. What color hair? Dark. Very dark. Eyes? Dark eyes, too. Dark complected, like he'd spent a lot of time outdoors. How was he dressed? A shirt and pants and a jacket, a light colored jacket. I think it was green. Did you notice any scars? Yes, come to think of it, I did. Across his forehead was a thin little ziggity zag. How old would you say he was? Oh, he, he was young, 35, maybe 40. Do you know if anyone else saw him, the other tenants? Oh, I haven't talked to any of them. I haven't left the apartment since this happened. You live alone, do you? Oh, my, no. Uh, my sis uh, sister Bessie stays with me. Where is she this afternoon? Uh, she went out of town <laughs> for a few days to visit her grandson and his family. They came down from Oxnard this morning together. I see. Tomorrow is her birthday. She'll be 80. I expect they're going to have quite a celebration. Yes, ma'am. 
Of course, they invited me along, but I didn't want to intrude. After all, it's Bessie's birthday, not mine. Sure. When I turn 80, I don't suppose anyone will lift a finger to give me a party the way they're all carrying on. You think it's such an accomplishment? They're even going to put her picture in the paper and write an article about her. Well, it is a pretty ripe old age. I don't see what is so ripe about it. After all, I'm nearly 79 myself. Oh, I know I don't look it. Everyone thinks there is least, at least a 10-year difference between us. And Bessie is failing. Yes, ma'am. Just a couple more questions, Miss Dunbetter. Certainly, young man, certainly. What time was it when you got home from the library? A 2.45, maybe a few minutes after. No later than 3, though. I see. How did he get into the apartment? Was the door locked? I thought it was. I, pr I always try to remember to lock it whenever I go out. But sometime I do forget. I guess I did today. Uh-huh. Do you think you'd recognize the burglar if you saw him again? I most certainly would. There's nothing the matter with my eyesight. It's as good as it ever was. My faculties aren't impaired, I'm happy to say. That's fine. We'd like to take you down to the office with us and show you some pictures. Oh? To see if you can identify him. I couldn't go like this. I'll have to change my dress first. Oh, oh I'm all right for walking around the neighborhood, but not going downtown. That's up to you, ma'am. Try not to touch anything in the bedroom. Uh, why not? We'll have a crew from the crime lab check for fingerprints. The pocketbook especially. Oh. Well, well I'm sure you won't find any. Ma'am? He, he was wearing mittens, uh, gloves. Well, we'll check anyway. Uh, say, Miss Dunbetter, while I think of it, who came from Kansas? Kansas? Well, it doesn't have anything to do with your case. I was kind of curious, that's all. I'm afraid I don't understand. Well, the name of this apartment is the Topeka Arms, so I figured somebody connected with it must have come from Kansas. Oh. Y you don't know who it was, do you? Now let me think. Oh, y yes, I, I remember that was old Mr. Hendrickson's idea. No, you don't say. Yes, he was the man who built this building. That was, oh, goodness sakes, almost 35 years ago. My, how time flies. I can, just can't believe I've lived here that long. You see, I was practically the first person to move in. Oh, uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, and this Mr. Hendrickson came from Kansas, did he? No, Minnesota. Uh, Minneapolis, as I recollect. Oh. But it was his idea, just the same, uh, calling it the Topeka Arms, on account of an article he read in the newspaper while the building was going up. Uh, remember him showing it to me? Poor Mr. Hendrickson. Gallbladder. Ma'am? Th that's what took him, his gallbladder. 1936. Oh. The building never been kept up properly since. Well, what was his reason for calling it the Topeka Arms? That newspaper write-up. Uh, yes, ma'am. It said there were more people in Southern California who came from Texas than from any other state. Uh -huh. So, Mr. Hendrickson figured the name Topeka would attract a lot of tenants. Ridiculous nonsense. I said so at the time. There hasn't been a single solitary one. Oh? Thirty-five years, not a soul from Kansas has ever lived here. Four oh five p.m. Frank and I put in a call to the crime lab. While Miss Dunbetter changed her dress, we checked the other apartments to see if anyone else had seen the burglar. On the second floor, only one tenant was in. Miss J.T. Blade, apartment six, informed us that she had been out marketing at the time of the crime and had just returned home. We went down to the first floor and stopped at apartment one. Who is it? Police officers. Oh, for Pete's sake, come on in. And cut out the corny jokes, will you, George? I say, who the heck are you? Police officers. 
Now, now, Mickey, get down. Mickey, get away from there. I'll have him shut up in the bedroom or you'll never get a minute's peace. He's just no good with strangers. Now, get in there. Are you guys for real? My name's Friday. This is my partner, Frank Smith. Here's the identification. Oh, looks like I goofed. I got such crazy friends. They're always pulling gags. Sure. Do you rent this apartment, ma'am? That's a matter of opinion. The way the other tenants check up on everything that goes on in here, you'd think they were paying the bills. Have you been in all afternoon? All day, for that matter. Except for a couple of hours this morning when I went down to the unemployment office to file my claim. I see. I'm a model. Do a little acting in pictures. Right now I'm having a bit of a dry spell. Uh-huh. Tina Malott. That's my professional name. You ever heard of me? Afraid not. Lousy press agent. Gonna make me famous overnight. Ten bucks a week I've been paying him for over six months now. If I died, I bet he couldn't get me an obituary notice. You're sure you've been here all afternoon? Yeah, why? Did you see anybody come into the building around three o'clock? Nope. Hear anybody? Afraid I ain't gonna be much use to you. I've got a late date tonight, so I was storing up a little extra sleep time. Just woke up a few minutes ago. Well, have you noticed any strangers hanging around this neighborhood lately? Ooh, what kind of strangers? How about a middle-aged man? Tall, dark hair, scar on his forehead? If he's been around, I haven't run into him. Do you usually keep your door locked? Sure, when I'm out. Was it locked this afternoon? You walked in, didn't you? Yes, ma'am. What are you guys building up to? One of the tenants has reported a burglary. In this apartment house? That's right. Holy smoke, it'd be just my luck at a time like this. Now where the heck's my pocketbook? I know I had it with me this morning. Is it over a... on the desk? Oh yeah, yeah, thanks. Five, 10, 11, whew, guess it's all here. What little there is. Looks like I had a break for once. That's a switch. Yes, ma'am. Well, sorry if we bothered you. Hey, wait a minute. You're holding out on me. How's that? Who got taken? Oh, Miss Dunbetter, apartment eight. Dunbetter? Uh-huh. Wouldn't you know it. One of the Yak Yak girls. Morning, noon, and night. Yak, yak, yak. They don't even stop for punctuation marks. Oh. For the last six months, that sister of hers has been drawn about her 80th birthday. I'm beginning to feel 80 myself. Now they'll have a new subject. Brother, I'll hear about this burglary till it comes out of my ears. You know something, mister? Hmm. I'd be better off if he'd rob me. Frank and I checked the other three apartments on the first floor. None of the tenants was at home. 4.16 p.m., the patrol car officers who had answered the call returned to the building. They reported that they had been unable to find anyone answering the suspect's description in the immediate vicinity. A few minutes later, Lee Jones and a crew from the crime lab arrived. They began their investigation, and we drove Miss Dunbetter down to the city hall. We checked the oddity file and ran the suspect's description in MO through the stats office, and they came up with 17 possibles. We pulled mug shots and showed them to Miss Dunbetter. She was unable to make an identification. 6.13 p.m., Lee Jones reported no useful fingerprints or other physical evidence in the apartment. 6.46 p.m., we drove Miss Dunbetter home and went off duty. The next day, May 20th, 11.17 a.m. I got it. Burglary, Friday. Who? Oh, sure, sure. Yeah? When he'd come in. Uh-huh. I see. Oh? I don't know. What's he look like? Uh-huh. Yeah, we'd like to. Okay. Thanks a lot. That was Chubb Stark. Who? You know, Stark. Bartender over at the Yellow Cat. Oh, yeah. Uh, what's he want? A guy came into his place last night. He was carrying a pretty big roll. Threw it around, bought drinks for the house. Uh-huh. 
Got kind of loaded, did some talking about how easy he'd picked up the dough. He just walked in again this morning. Sound like anything to you? Chubb says he's about six foot black hair. Yeah. Scar on his forehead. Put a smile in your smoking. Next time you buy cigarettes, stop. Remember this. It's today's biggest cigarette news. Chesterfield is made the modern way with AccuRay. The AccuRay controller is the greatest improvement in cigarette making in years, and it's a Chesterfield exclusive. This amazing quality detective electronically checks and controls the making of your Chesterfields, giving a uniformity and smoking quality never before possible. So buy Chesterfield today. For the first time, you get a perfect smoke column from end to end. A perfect smoke column from end to end. From the first puff to the last puff, your Chesterfield smokes smoother. From the first puff to the last puff, your Chesterfield smokes cooler. From the first puff to the last puff, Chesterfield is best for you. Next time you buy cigarettes, stop. Remember... Chesterfield is made the modern way with AccuRay. Frank and I drove. Frank and I drove out to the Yellow Cat Bar on Figaro. Chubb Stark, the bartender, pointed out a husky man sitting in a corner booth. We went over to talk to him. Stand up. Huh? We're police officers. Stand up. Okay, okay. You can sit down again. Something eating, you guys. What's your name? Why? Come on, what's your name? What is it? Portlong. Ralph Portlong. Where do you live, Portlong? Around the corner. How long you been staying there? Since last night. Before that. Back east. I just got in town yesterday. Whereabouts back east? What kind of a roust is this? Whereabouts? All over. Chicago. Cleveland. All over. What kind of business you in? Unemployed. You got any money? Some. How much? I ain't no vague, if that's what you're getting at. How much? Hundred bucks. Maybe a hundred and fifty. Where'd you get it? Borrowed it. Who from? A pal. In L.A.? Chicago. What's his name? Johnson. Cliff Johnson. Address? I don't know. He moves around. Same as I do. How are you going to pay him back if you don't know where he lives? We'll bump into each other. And when was it you got in town, Port Long? I told you. Yesterday. What time? Six o'clock. Somewhere in there. Yesterday morning? Last night. You sure of that? Yeah. How'd you come? Train? Car. Your own car? Hits the ride. Just where were you yesterday afternoon? Riding into L.A. All afternoon? Yeah. What was the driver's name? How should I know? I've been hitching for the last week. Must have rode with 20 different guys. You don't remember the one you were with yesterday? Uh Uh-uh. You ever been arrested, Port Long? Nothing serious. Now tell us about it. Drunk. That's all. Where was this? Ohio. When I was a kid. Anything else? Some speeding tickets. You ever been arrested in California? Never been in California. First trip, huh? Yeah. And you ain't exactly making me feel welcome either. You know an apartment house called the Topeka Arms? Whereabouts? Sixth and Olympic. Where's that? In L.A. Can't you get nothing straight? I ain't never been here before. Uh Uh-huh. Now, how about giving me an answer? Why the roust? Come on, let's go. What for? We'll show you the sights. For instance? City Hall. 
Frank and I took the suspect, the suspect into custody for further questioning. 12.16 p.m., we ran the name Ralph Portlong through R&I. They had nothing on him. We put out an APB with his description stating that he was in our custody. The bulletin requested any information about the suspect and was marked attention Chicago PD and Cleveland Police Department. 2.18 p.m., we again interviewed Portlong. He insisted he had not arrived in Los Angeles until 6 o'clock the previous evening and refused to say anything more. 4.06 p.m., we received replies to our APB on Portlong. Chicago reported two convictions for grand theft auto, and Cleveland reported one conviction for burglary second degree. We telephoned Miss Dunbetter and arranged for her to attend a special show up at the main jail. 6.17 p.m., the show up was completed, and Frank and I took the victim back to our office. You're absolutely sure it isn't the same man? My goodness gracious, I ought to know. Yes, ma'am. I don't see how you could have made such a mistake. He fits your description, even the scar. But I told you it was a ziggity zag. Uh-huh. This man's scar is diff entirely different. Oh. And his hair is wrong, too. Is that so? The other man had some gray in it, right across here. I thought you said he was fairly young. A body doesn't have to be old to get gray. Why, I've been gray ever since I had my appendix out, and I was only 34. Yes, ma'am. We'll have you taken home now. It's really a shame. Ma'am? That you arrested that poor fellow when he hasn't done anything. Burglary Friday. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Oh? When did you get it? I see. No, not yet. Sure. Will you notify him? Okay. I guess we don't need to feel too sorry for Portlong. What do you mean, Joe? Another answer on our APB. Oh? You were right, Miss Dunbetter. He couldn't have been your burglar. I told you, didn't I? He was in Needles yesterday afternoon. Hitched a ride. Yeah? Slugged the driver. Ralph Portlong was held pending arrival of authorities from Needles. The investigation of the apartment house burglary continued. Two more suspects were brought in for questioning. Both men succeeded in establishing alibis for the time of the crime. Monday, May 23rd, 1.48 p.m., Frank and, Frank and I were on our way back to the office from lunch. How was your pie? Okay. Just okay? It was all right. Lemon meringue, huh? Yeah. Should have had apple. Uh-huh. I told you, Joe, stick with apple. You can't go wrong. The lemon was fine. You didn't finish it. I was full. Sure. Well, someday you'll learn. Learn what? Apple pie is always safe. You can't louse it up, even a bad cook. I get a little tired of it once in a while, that's all. No reason you should. You could switch it around so many different ways. Uh-huh. Cheese, a la mode, hot sauce. No reason to get tired of apple, Joe. Sure. Hey, Joe. Yeah? Call for you while you were out. Oh. She wants you to call back. Here's the number. Thanks. Sure. Hmm. Bessie Maxson. Well, who's she? I don't know. Mrs. Maxson? This is the police department, Sergeant Friday. Yes, that's right. Yes, we were the ones who... Yes, ma'am. I see. Yes, I guess we can. Is something wrong? Oh. You sure of that? All right, right away. Thanks for calling. Bye. Miss Dunbetter's sister. She just got back from Oxnard. Yeah? Says it never happened. Huh? The burglary. Says her sister made it up. Frank and I drove out to the Topeka Arms and went to department number eight. It was 2.17 when we got there.
Somebody's coming. Yeah. Well, what is it? Mrs. Maxson? That's right, that's right. My name's Friday. I just spoke to you over the phone. Oh, yes, yes, of course. This is my partner, Frank Smith. Oh, how do you do? Please come in. Yes, ma'am. I just don't know what to say. I suppose it's all my fault for going out of town. I never should have left Martha alone. I might have known she'd be up to something. Are you absolutely sure about this, Mrs. Maxson? About what? About what? That there wasn't any burglary? Oh, never. Never in a million years. Your sister gave us all the details. Play acting. That's all it was. Play acting. She's done it all her life. I see. You mean Miss Dunbetter isn't, uh... Um... My sister is as sane as you are, if that's what you're driving at. Then why did she tell us that story? I haven't the vaguest notion. She simply won't give me any explanation. Did she tell you about the burglary? Certainly not. Certainly not. She knows better than to hand me any of her cock and bull stories. I can see right through them. Who did tell you about it? When I got home this morning, everybody in the building was discussing it. The news was in all the papers. Mrs. Parker saved me the clippings for me. Uh Uh-huh. Well, just what is it that makes you so sure your sister was lying? In the first place, Martha never had $300 in her whole life. I see. And in the second place, if the story is true, why wouldn't she face me? Why is she hiding? Hiding? The minute I told her I was going to call you, she locked herself in the bathroom. Oh. She's been in there for two hours now. She simply refuses to come out. Well, we want to talk to her if we can. I'll try again. The fact that you're here may have some influence. Think we've been getting the runaround, Joe? Sounds that way. Yeah. Martha? Martha, you come out here this instant. Martha Dunbetter, do you hear me? The police want here, want to talk to you. Now come out. The police are here. I won't. I won't ever come out. I've never heard of such childishness. You'll see I'm not able to do a thing with her. Yes, ma'am. Maybe if you speak to her, she'll come to her senses. Okay. My own sister, carrying on like this, I don't know how I'll ever be able to hold my head up again. It's scandalous. Miss Dunbetter, this is Sergeant Friday, Miss Dunbetter. Will you please come out so we can talk to you? Miss Dunbetter. Well, it's about time. What were you thinking, Martha? What got into you? I am not speaking to you, Bessie. Let's go in the other room. Be easier to talk there. Yes, sir. Not speaking to me, huh? Well, two can play at that game, I assure you, and I won't be the one who suffers. Do you want to sit down? All right, Miss Dunbetter. Can we clear this thing up now? Your sister says there wasn't any burglary. And just how would she know? She wasn't here, was she? I know, because I know you. (laughs) And now I know you never had $300 to your name. I did, too. Where did you get it? Where did you get it? It's none of your business. How about it, Miss Dunbetter? Did you have $300? Well... I never said it was exactly 300 not to the penny. Three dollars would be more like it. There happens to be a few things that you don't know about, including my savings. A likely story. You never saved a penny in your life. What about my dime bank? I shook it just the other day. I will thank you to keep your hands off off of my property. Savings indeed. If I didn't pay most of the expenses around here, you'd starve to death. I managed quite well before you moved in on me. Bessie and I was perfectly happy living alone. As a matter of fact, I preferred that arrangement. Maybe you'd like to try it again. Maybe I would. I'm sure I'd be money ahead. Ha! 
don't you ha me, Bessie Mason. You ought to see the way she eats. Gobble, 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 she shovels it down. Stuff and nonsense. I don't have any more appetite than a bird. Birds don't nip at the cooking sherry. Martha Dunbetter, how can you say such a thing? Because I know it's true. I mark the bottle. Well, whatever I do, I don't fib to the police like some people I could name. Well, Miss Dunbetter? I may have exaggerated a speck. Uh Uh-huh. I didn't mean to do any harm. Did you know it's against the law to file a false police report? Against the law? There, you see, you're going to jail. I knew it would happen. I knew it sooner or later. You disgrace us all. Why'd you do it? You must have had a reason. I won't tell you. Not in front of her, I won't. Oh. Would you mind waiting in the other room for a couple of minutes, Mrs. Maxson? I most certainly would. We'd appreciate it, ma'am. Oh, very well. Very well. You'd think I was the criminal around here. All right, Miss Dunbetter. Go ahead. It's very difficult to explain. Uh Uh-huh. You see, it was all on account of her, Bessie. Go on. It started when we were little girls. Just because she was older, she was always lording it over me. Mama and Daddy always gave her everything first. Hand-me-downs, that's all I ever got. Bessie's (laughs) hand-me-downs. Then, when we grew up, I couldn't push myself very much. She was just the opposite. The belle of the ball. She had to... Her pick of all the young gentlemen in town, the only time they take me out is when Bessie was busy. And don't think she didn't let me know that I was the second choice. The only reason she she married Horace was because he took a fancy to me. Well, I had my pride too. I, I wouldn't settle for her leftovers. That's why I stayed single. I see. The least she could have done was name one of her little girls after me. After all, I am her only sister. You still haven't told us why you reported the burglary, Miss Dunbetter. I am telling you. Yes, ma'am. It was on account of her birthday. That was the last straw. She hadn't talked about anything else for months and months. Just because she's 80 years old, you would think she was the queen of Romania. Her picture in the paper, people making a fuss about her. Well, I made up my mind that for once in my life, someone was going to make a fuss about me. Mm -hmm. And to tell you the truth, I'm not sorry a bit. I'm not sorry I did it. I mean, I guess I should be sorry, but I, I'm not. I really enjoyed myself. All of those questions you asked me like I was somebody. And my name was in the newspapers, too. First time it ever happened. It's kind of strange when you think about it. To live 79 years without ever seeing your name in print. But, but that wasn't the best part. Ma'am? The best part was Bessie not being able to horn in and take all of the credit. Oh, I knew you'd find me out sooner or later, but I didn't care. I sure had the laugh on her. All the time, she was in Oxnard being partied. I was having a little party of my own. You know you didn't need to put us through all this, Miss Dunbetter. You're almost 80 yourself. It's over a year away. When you're my age, you can't be sure of anything. Yes, ma'am. Besides, even when I'm 80, Bessie will still be ahead. Ma'am? She'll be going on 90. The story you have heard is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. On May 26, a hearing was held at the office of Perry Thomas, city attorney. In a moment, the results of that hearing. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Put a smile in your smoking. Buy Chesterfield. It's the best cigarette ever made for my money. Smooth, satisfying, 
mild and mellow. Believe me, in the whole wide world, no cigarette satisfies like Chesterfield. Due to the advanced age of Miss Martha Dunbetter, and because of her assurances that she would never repeat her actions, no charges were filed against her. One man stands between death and ten people on TV's new dramatic program, Mr. Citizen, next week. See Edward Binns star in the true story, Terror on Jack Rabbit Hill. Check your local TV listings for Mr. Citizen. And hear Dragnet next week, same time, same station. The Dragnet players tonight were the Chesterfield girl, Nell Brennan, <laughs> one of our announcers, uh, Gibney, uh, who also is our Foley man, does the sound effects, and even does pet tricks, Marty McNeely, <laughs> McNulty. <laughs> Sergeant Joe Friday of the LA Police Department John Byhan, and uh, Joe's partner, Officer Frank Smith, Jay Summerfield, uh, Martha Dunbetter, not a day over 79, Allison Byhan, uh, Tina Malott, young actress model, Sue Gajinski. And the suspect, Ralph Portlong, Andre Dixon. Uh, the voice in the police station, George Succi. <laughs> Bessie Maxson, Martha's sister, Amy Nieves. I was one of your announcers, Herb Thompson. And I now would like to call on tonight's director, Jay Summerfield. Director.